so far we've been considering optimization in the context of finding specific minima to functions that are potentially constrained. But what if you wanted to optimize the entire path? What if instead you wanted to consider integrals between two points in time of functions of the state and control and time independent parameters and time? In order to find solutions that are optimal in some sense over the complete path, we need to introduce the concept of optimal control. Optimal control can be thought of as an extension of nonlinear programming, however, with an infinite number of points considered, that is the continuous integral over whole paths. A formal statement of optimal control is that we wish to find the control input u, which is a function of time, that minimizes a cost function j that is composed of final state costs, which are encoded via a function phi operating on the state at the final time and the final time, plus the path cost, which is the integral over the entire time span of the path, t naught to tf, of some function l that is a function of x and u and t. This general encoding of the cost function provides an enormous deal of flexibility because it allows you to encode all manner of things that you might be interested in. So here are some standard forms for these types of cost functions that are utilized in optimal control. Your cost function j can simply be the integral from t0 to tf of 1, which of course evaluates to the difference between the final time and the initial time, which means that what you are optimizing, what you are trying to minimize, is the duration of the path. You are trying to get to where you're going as fast as possible. Alternatively, you can be integrating just the path costs, where you have some function m dot integrated in time, where m dot is some function of the state and the controls. You will recognize that we're using m dot here because this is descriptive of how you would evaluate fuel use or the integrated mass flow rate, for example. In this case, you do not care about how long it takes you to get there. You really just care about how much fuel you burn getting there. Alternatively, you may care just about hitting the final values of your trajectory, in which case you could write a quadratic system of the form x at the final time minus some desired x, xd, which is constant, transpose times a weight matrix w times the same thing, x set tf minus xd. If this w matrix is the identity matrix, that means that you care about each element of your state equally, or you can use this to tune how much you care about the different elements of your state getting to exactly where you want them to go. So an example of this might be you care a lot more about hitting a precise position than you do about hitting a precise velocity, or maybe you care a lot more about hitting a precise velocity than you do about a precise position. This form allows you to encode all of that. Similarly, we can have a quadratic path cost function where we are integrating from t naught to tf of u transpose times some weight matrix w times u. And the most general quadratic form of all of this, we have quadratic final state costs and quadratic path costs, where we introduce matrices q, m, and r. q encodes how much you care about the path costs on your state. That is, whether you want to bound your state along the way. r encodes how much you care about the control costs along the path, and M encodes how much you care about the mixture of state and control costs. And it might be very common to set a bunch of these to zero, especially in the case where you don't have any special reason to constrain the state, but want to heavily constrain the control. A caveat here is that this minimization is not unconstrained. It must be constrained by the dynamics of the system. Any path that you end up finding via the optimal control method must be consistent with the dynamics of your system. And so the constraint, your dynamics, which is a function of the state x and the control u and the time dependent parameters p and the disturbances w and time, must equal the derivative of x for all time. So f minus x dot must be continuously zero from t naught to tf. And so we can define an augmented cost function which is our final state costs plus our path costs plus the Lagrange multipliers or costates times the constraint function also integrated from T naught to TF. 
because this constraint must be continuously satisfied over this range of independent variables. We define a Hamiltonian as the Lagrangian, this L function, which was the function encoding our path cost, plus lambda transpose times the dynamics. This allows us to rewrite our augmented cost function as the final state costs plus the integral from T0 to TF of the Hamiltonian in time minus the integral from T0 to TF of lambda transpose times the time derivative of the state X. We can integrate this second integral by parts. Recall the integral of U dV is equal to UV minus the integral of V dU. In this case, we have u is lambda transpose, dv is x dot dt, which means that du is lambda dot transpose dt, and v is just x. And so from this, that final integrand will have the form lambda transpose x evaluated at tf minus its value at t naught minus the integral from t naught to tf of lambda dot transpose x. We plug this back into our augmented cost function, and we have this expression. The cost function is now the final state costs plus that difference in the costates and states, their products at the initial time minus the final time, plus the remaining integral in the Hamiltonian plus lambda dot transpose x. This is the piece of this integral that survived the integration by parts. We are looking for the extremum of this function that is, we are looking for the variation in ja, delta ja, to be equal to zero. We define the variation in an argument, this delta of some argument, as the partial of the argument with respect to the control times the variation in the control, plus the partial of the argument with respect to the state times the variation of the state as a function of the variation in the control. This definition allows us to write the variation in our cost function, delta ja, as the costates transpose times the variation in the state evaluated at the initial time. And instantly, we can neglect this term because the initial control will have no effect on the initial state. The initial state is a given. It is a fixed part of the specific problem that we are solving. Next, we will have the partial in our final state cost with respect to the state minus the transpose of the costates times the variation in the state evaluated at the final time, and then the integral in time from the initial time to the final time of the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the state plus the time derivative of the costate transpose times the variation in the state plus the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the control times the variation of the control. At this point, just as it was true in our original derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equations, for this delta ja to be equal to zero, each multiplier of every variation here, this variation in x, this variation in x, and this variation in u, must independently go to zero itself. And that means that we have three independent expressions. From the final state cost, we have that the costates evaluated at the final time must be equal to the partial of five with respect to the state evaluated at that final time. And from within this integral, both of these arguments in the integrand must also go to zero which means that the time derivative of the costates must be equal to negative the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the state, and the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the control must itself be zero. These two expressions must apply for the entire span of trajectory, so for every time between T0 and Tf. This term serves as an initial condition for this differential expression. If you integrate backwards in time, you can start at the final value of the costates and then integrate backwards to the initial value of the costates. Collectively, these three expressions are a restatement of the Euler Lagrange equations simply in a different form. These are the necessary conditions for optimality. For sufficient conditions, we turn to what is known as Pontryagin's maximum principle. The fact that we have the partial of h with respect to u is equal to zero implies that an optimal u is an extremum of the Hamiltonian h. Pontryagin's principle states that it is a minimum over the whole trajectory. That is, the optimal u, which we'll call u star, is given by the u that minimizes 
the Hamiltonian, which is a function of x and u and the costates lambda, over the entirety of the trajectory. As before, let's motivate this with a simplified example. We will consider the case of a cart that is being moved by a control input u and has its position given by the coordinate x. We wish to move this cart 100 meters in 10 seconds. And we wish to use a minimum amount of effort and to minimize the final velocity. The dynamics of the system are given by the derivative of the position is the velocity. The derivative of the velocity is the acceleration, which is the specific force or the applied force divided by the mass of the cart. We will form a state vector x, which is the position and its derivative, x and x dot, which means that the derivative of the state x dot is going to be the second element of x, which we'll call x2 plus f over m, and our initial conditions x of t naught, equivalently, we'll call it x naught, are going to be 0, 0. So we're starting the cart from rest and from a 0 position, which is arbitrarily set to 0. Our final state, we know that we have to drive the cart to 100 meters, but we're leaving the velocity open, just that we wish to minimize it. We can write this all in a linear form. X dot is equal to some matrix F times X plus G U. In general, U would be a vector and G would be a matrix, but in this case, we have a scalar control input. And so G is a matrix, but U is a scalar value. What this looks like is, 0, 1, 0, 0 times x1 and x2. So this is encoding the fact that the first element of this derivative is just the second element of the original state, plus the control in the second element of the derivative. And so u here is understood to be the acceleration or the specific force, f over m. We have a final state constraint and a total path constraint. And so we will encode these as x1 at the final time minus 100 meters squared times q, where q is our weight on the final state constraint, plus u squared times r, where r is the weight on the control, on the path constraint. The utility of using these quadratic forms is that they give you functions whose minima is zero. Because these become strictly positive quantities, your optimizer doesn't need to worry about driving things to negative values or looking for particular zero crossings. It is just blindly trying to minimize the function, and you have set it up in such a way that zero is the absolute minimum. Our Hamiltonian is therefore ru squared plus lambda transpose times the dynamics, so fx plus gu. And we apply the Euler Lagrange equations, and we have lambda dot is equal to negative the partial of h in our state x transpose which evaluates to negative this F matrix transpose times the costates lambda. And this written in component form gives us the system. Lambda one dot is zero and lambda two dot is negative lambda one. The rest of the Euler Lagrange equations tell us that the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the control transpose is equal to zero which means that we can write 2RU plus G transpose lambda is equal to zero, which is the same as 2RU plus lambda two equaling zero. And finally, we need to provide an initial condition for this differential equation. And we get that by writing lambda, the costates of the final time, must be equal to the partial of the final state constraint with respect to the state transposed evaluated at the final time, which means that the first co-state evaluated at the final time must be 2q, where q was that weighting that we applied to the final state constraint times the difference between the final value of the first element of the state and 100 meters. The second element of this just evaluates to zero. We put this final condition together with these differential equations, and we write 
lambda dot one is equal to zero, which means that for all time, lambda one is equal to its value at the final time step, which is 2q times x1 at tf minus 100 meters. And lambda two dot is equal to negative lambda one for all time, which means that lambda two as a function of time will be lambda two evaluated at the final time minus lambda one evaluated at the final time times tf minus t. Remember the ordering here is because we're running time backwards from the final time back to the initial time. And this evaluates to 2q times the final x1 state minus 100 meters times tf minus t. We now have a value for lambda 2, which we can plug back into this expression and overall write the optimal control input is given by negative q over r. So the ratio of the weights that we placed on the final state costs and the path costs or control costs times the difference between the final position and 100 meters, the desired final position, times the final time minus the current time. In terms of implementing this as a controller, we can define K1 as negative Q over R times this difference times the final time, and K2 as just Q over R times the difference between the final position and 100 meters. And then our control will be written as K1 plus K2T. We can also penalize the final velocity, in which case we would redefine our final state cost to be something like phi equal to a weight Q1 times the difference between the final position and the desired 100 meters squared plus a weight Q2 times the square of the final velocity. Because if we want to drive the final velocity to as close to zero as possible, that is the same as driving this expression to zero. This is, of course, an incredibly simplified example, but it illustrates the basic application of Hamilton's equations. In general, you will not be able to analytically find solutions because in general, the dynamics will be nonlinear and much more complicated than this. And so we will need to use a variety of numerical techniques in order to actually evaluate the optimal control solutions. But the basic setup for the conditions for optimality will be effectively the same as shown here.